Hi, everyone, and welcome to our event tonight. My name is John Clinton with Penguin Random House. First, I want to give a special thanks to the International Churchill Society, who's co-producing this event with us tonight. I have just a few housekeeping items to touch on before I turn things over to tonight's fantastic speakers. First, as a reminder, please keep your audio and video muted throughout the session. If you would like to submit questions for our speakers, you can email them to me. I'll be reminding you of my email address in the chat, which can be activated at the bottom of your screen. You can also comment along and of course applaud for our speakers as you see fit throughout in that same chat. For the best viewing experience on a computer, we suggest finding the gallery view button, which is in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom window. Once you're in gallery view, if you hover over any of the black tiles with a name on it, you should see a little blue ellipsis as the three dots. Click on this and find hide non-video participants. This should clear up your screen so you only see me right now. On a mobile device, you can swipe left to access gallery view and you can hide non-video participants by tapping more and going into your meeting settings. I think doing this is definitely helpful because then you will only see our speakers once they come out onto the digital stage, which I'll ask them to do right now. Um, Eric and Christina, please activate your camera and your audio. And while our speakers are getting settled, I'll mention that Eric Larson is the best-selling author of The Devil in the White City and Dead Wake. And tonight he's going to be discussing his latest instant New York Times bestseller, The Splendid and the Vile, which takes readers back to Winston Churchill's London during the Blitz. Eric will be speaking with Christina Baker Klein, number one New York Times bestselling author of eight novels, including Orphan Train and the forthcoming The Exiles coming out in September. So with all of that, I'll now turn things over to Christina. Thank you, John. It's so nice to be here. And yep. Eric, I'm <clears throat> so glad to be here with you. Yeah, me too, me too. So I was just remembering today that we actually met when you were on your last hardcover book tour um, yep. for the wonderful Dead Wake. We met in Philadelphia. I had given a talk the night before, and then I was visiting some schools, and I learned you were going to be at the same library that night, so I stuck around, and I went to your incredible presentation, and then I went to bed. We were staying in the same hotel, and I remember getting a text at midnight. We shared a media escort. And she texted and said, Eric and I are downstairs. Yeah, just having... a media escort, yes, so yes. Yes, remember, a media escort, someone who sort of took us around. And she said, we're down <clears> in the bar, <throat> come join us. And so our first introduction, I was wearing pajamas and we had cocktails. And that's sort of defined our relationship ever since, I think. Uh -huh. um, we both live in New York and we've managed to meet up all over town and share cocktails. And uh, is it saying too much that my favorite place is the Drunken Monkey? That sounds like the ideal thing to say at this point because it reminds me of the old days. <laughs> I know, I know. It, well, it's hard to know when we'll be back to that. Yeah. But I'm so delighted to be yeah. here, so yeah. Much. So I wanted to start actually by talking about your move to New York City. You lived in Seattle for many years. I know that you were born on the East Coast uh, in the New York area. You can talk about that. But um, you lived in Seattle. And then when your children were grown, you and your wife moved back into the city. Um, and you've said in interviews that moving to New York City made the events of 9-11 viscerally real to you in a yeah. way that they hadn't been before. And that that, I think, led you in some ways to write this book. So I'd love to hear more about that. Well, very definitely, I led directly to have to, to writing this book. Um, you know, we we had lived in Seattle, as you say, for a number of years. I think like seventeen years or so. We had three daughters. The daughters, as daughters do, um, grew up and moved out of the house, and it got awfully quiet in the house. So we decided, you know, as one does, to move to Manhattan. Um, I had I was you know uh, born in Brooklyn and raised on Long Island. Always wanted to live in Manhattan, and now was the opportunity. So I moved to Manhattan, and really almost immediately upon arrival, had this this profound sense that that the events of 9/11, which you know we observed um, in real time on CNN, um, uh, and and found absolutely horrific. But I, I quickly realized that the experience of 9/11 in New York City 
was was vastly more more vivid and and, and wrenching than anything we could possibly have imagined. You know, um, uh, not only did New York residents, um, you know, see the smoke, uh, you know, hear the sirens and, and, and so forth, there was also that sense of violation of your, your hometown, that your, your home city was attacked. So I started thinking uh, almost you know, at the same time about, well, you know, the London Blitz and, and how anybody could possibly have endured that, because that involved the first phase, 57 consecutive nights of bombing of, of London followed by six more months of, of intensifying raids um, uh, until May 10, 1941. And I started to wonder how on earth could anybody have endured that sort of, a, sort of an onslaught? I started thinking about maybe writing about a typical London family. And then I thought, wait a minute, why not write about the quintessential London family, Churchill and his family and his advisors? And that's what led to the book. It was not a fascination with Churchill or that particular time period. Um, it was a fascination with that question, how do you survive this situation? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting um, that the book came out in this moment. <laughs> we had 9-11 and now here we are. And reading reviews and responses from readers, many thousands of responses from readers, people mention again and again how interesting it's been to read about this period while we're going through this now. Yeah, I find this, I find this honestly fascinating. You know, it's like, as best I can tell, people are finding um, uh, solace in, in this book about the Blitz. Um, and, and I, I kind of get that. I mean, there, there was something heroic about Churchill's management of that period. And I think people now really want something heroic. They want to get a sense of a time when there was, there was something unfolding that was akin to, to a pandemic, but where, where they were in, you know, people were in sure hands and, and the outcome, while not, not clear at all, the outcome seemed to be something that, that, that perhaps could be foretold thanks to the strength of a particular leader. Um, so I find it fascinating that, that people have embraced this book. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of delighted, honestly, because, you know, I set out uh, on a book tour um, to, to launch this book. And three weeks in, on March 12th, which, by the way, is my wife's birthday, which is a reminder of every day, um, suddenly everything went to hell. And, uh, and uh, happily, though, the book seems to have a life now. Yeah, I mean, it has a huge life. Um, one of the things that you do so beautifully in the book is to show how complex Churchill was. He was in financial straits. He was uh, a bully in a lot of ways. A lot of people, even his private secretary, complained about how irascible and ill-tempered he could be. People, a lot of people thought he drank too much. He was this larger than life character who actually had a lot of sort of what you might think of as character flaws. And yet he managed to galvanize the country. How yeah. did he do that? Well, first of all, let's talk about his flaws, and then let's talk about the, the, the heroic side of things. You know, this is a guy who, who, who was deeply inconsiderate to his staff. He had this cadre of private secretaries, one of whom is a, is a, a key character in the book, John, John Colville. Um, he tended to treat them with, with um, uh, well, he, he, he was deeply inconsiderate. Um, uh, he had no sense of, of, of what it was like to intrude on their time or their lives. He could be very rude. And yet they loved him. They loved him because first of all, he was a lot of fun. Also, he was heroic, he was confident, he, he was courageous. And I think that is sort of how he, how he appeared to his staff, why his staff came to love him is exactly why the British populace took so much strength from him. Yeah, I mean, um, it comes across clearly that he was larger than life to them even, that he was this sort of big presence. Um, and you describe how for Christmas, for example, his staff wanted, they, they carefully worded um, a you know, request that they could possibly have some days off and he scrawled no across it and said, if I'm working, you're working. People kept trying to quit and he wouldn't let them quit. I love all of those details. You sort of capture this very um, frenetic and yet clearly top-down organization where everybody ultimately does his bidding. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, 
Yeah, when I set out to do the book, I, I had that particular lens that I described, this idea of how does one go about surviving a situation like that? And that really helped me get into, into Churchill's character in a way that, that other, believe it or not, even though there's been so much written about Churchill, that believe it or not, um, to my knowledge, nobody else has done is, is that deep sort of portrayal of how he and his and his advisors and his family went about surviving the Blitz on a daily basis, and and using that as my as my lens and getting into the the nitty gritty of it really gave me some insights into how how he actually managed to do it in, from from the smallest of ways to to the to the most profound. You know, I, I, I came away for one thing very early on with an appreciation of what made him a, a, a powerful leader. One of which was that he had this real grasp of the power of symbolic acts. Even something as simple as refusing to call Hitler by his name. He would only say that man or that wicked man, which when you think about it, is really a very clever way to sort of, to help demystify and de-demonize this, 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 this guy. But then at the other end of the spectrum was, you know, he was not ashamed to, to, to cry, to feel emotion and to express it in public as he did after the first deliberate bombing of London when he visited the docks and it's the chaos and so forth. And it was a risk by the way, when he did that, that people would resent his presence, that, that they would feel that, that, that why had he and the government failed to protect them? But of course the opposite happened, they loved him and that became very much a pattern for the rest of his career, I read for the rest of that year actually, where he would visit bombed out areas and, and really, really hearten those people who were there. He seemed to ch channel the sort of, the swelling tide of the British public's um, right. feeling about the war and about the fear they had about it all. You know, um, it's well, interesting. Yeah. The way I like to put it is that he, yeah. he, taught, he taught them the art of being fearless. He that's that's how I like to think of it. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, sorry. They were really looking to, to him for that and they got it. They got exactly what they wanted from him, which was so, which becomes so abundantly clear. One of the things I love about this book that I, I don't see very often is that, speaking of Hitler, you present the other side, what they're thinking, uh, you know, what they're feeling, what they're doing. There's this sort of chilling description of Goring's uh, Christmas with his family where he acknowledges that people are suffering and here he is having this wonderful time. But one of the things I wondered if, if you had done, or one of the things I wondered if you had noticed was that Goring bore a little bit of resemblance to someone in the present day, and let me just say, so um, so you share a German general's observation, for example, that Goring's hair had been dyed yellow, his eyebrows were penciled, his cheeks rouged. He was sitting there looking like a jellyfish, or, or this. He was easily influenced by a small clique of sycophants. His court favorites changed frequently since his favor could only be won and held by means of constant flattery intrigue and expensive gifts. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how uh, Churchill led the nation in that crisis. And then I was thinking about Goring on the other side and that it must have been so much fun in a way for you to do these characterizations um, and even thinking about the world today. Well, fun <laughs> fun makes, <laughs> makes this out a lot easier than in fact it, it, it was. But you know, I, I felt it was very important to, to to get the German side into the book, not not like you know <laughs> justify or excusing anything, but to show, for reasons actually of narrative and narrative suspense, frankly, to show what they were thinking at a particular time. And Hermann Goering was 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 as I referred to him in the book, he, he was joyously corrupt, even as even as these these events were unfolding, even as he was unleashing his air force on, on, on Britain with pledges to Hitler that he could, he could bring uh, Churchill to his knees in four days, even as he was doing this. Um, he was also leading this, this, this vast uh, corrupt criminal network of art theft and, 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 and art uh, and acquisition by, 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 by muscling 
paintings and so forth from people who did not necessarily want to sell them. You know, to the point where we had like four, four trains at, at, in use at any given time, collecting art from all over Europe and being brought to Paris, where he would look over the art and decide what, would, what should go into his own country estate, Karen Hall. This guy was as corrupt as they get. Um, and, 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 but it was very interesting, I think, to, to be able to show um, how he was thinking about Churchill, how he was thinking about Britain, what he was planning, because obviously the British did not know what he was thinking or planning. And frankly, that's the essence of suspense. You know something's going to happen. You know the other characters whom you perhaps care about by now don't know it. And so that really, I think, is very compelling for, for, for readers and certainly for me as a, as, a, as a writer. Yeah, that's one of the things that made the book so exciting was that you were going back and forth not only between these two different sides, but also between the personal and the sort of uh, machinery of war. So you had lots of interior um, parts as well that we'll talk about in a second. But I wanted to ask you about this, which is that you often write about neglected or little known pieces of history, but Churchill is one of the most written about historical figures of all time. Oh, really? And I wonder, did you feel daunted? Did you worry about what you ha might have to add to the conversation? How did you find a way in? Boy, uh, boy, did I feel daunted. But you know, there's the old expression, uh, a, a, a fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And you know, you know I, I, I had this lens, I had this idea that I wanted to explore and I knew that Churchill had been written about you know, significantly. But I don't think I really appreciated the extent to which he'd been written about until I finally got into the research. And then I thought to myself, you know, honestly, time and time, again, probably every day for, for four and a half years, at some point, I thought to myself, what on earth am I trying to do? How am I going to deal with all this material? But I made a decision very early on, a strategic decision, that I was not even going to try to read everything that was written about Churchill. It's a fool's errand. I could read for a full decade and probably not read everything. Actually, I know I would not be able to read everything because in that 10th year, eight more books would come out and I'd have to start all over again. So I decided that what I would do is make a strategic decision to just read enough to understand the Churchillian landscape and then dive right into the archives, which is when I, where I feel most comfortable. Um, and, and using my, my fresh lens, try to find and say something new, which I believe actually I, I did. I know I did, because when you have a new question, when you have a new lens, you, you look at things differently and you will find new things. And so that's what buoyed me through the whole process. But boy, it was, it was pretty daunting, you know, and, and, and actually that's why in the end, you know, I, I, I realized that with so much written about Churchill, I had to be really, really careful to make sure that, I mean, you, you always want to get it right. But you know, you also need to really like in a case like this, get it right, right, like beyond right. And so for the first time, actually, I, I, you know, I, I often have readers read my, my, my manuscripts, but in this case, I sent the book out to three Churchill experts, three top Churchill experts, because I wanted to make sure that I had everything good. I also hired for the first time in my life, a, uh, in my career, a professional fact checker to also backstop me. Because it was just so, you, 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 it was so much material and so many experts. It's like writing about the Civil War, which right. I swore, by the way, that I would never write about. And I hold to that particular uh, vow. So far. So far. Never um, say never, right? Never say never. So um, I know that you're still working on what your next book idea. You know, you never know. Um, well, one of the things well, I, that... I just killed one today. You did what? I killed an idea. Oh, you it. Uh, this was my quarantine idea and I was working on it for the last four weeks. And today, uh, come to Jesus moment. And I think it's, I think it's a, it's dead, but you know, you know, for every, for every dead idea, there's a great idea standing at the graveside with a fistful of dirt. That's my feeling. That's, that's my kind of a great line. Actually. I think I might have to use that one. <laughs> that's a great line. Um, so back to your research for a second. You say, I don't remember where you said this, but maybe in your notes. Uh, you said, lunch. Yeah, or at lunch. Although we probably didn't talk about this at lunch. No. Uh, that the great stuff is in the footnotes of other books of conventional or academic histories and that you found this new material in the archives simply because you were really looking for it and other people weren't. So give an example or give some examples of what you mean by that. 
Well, yeah, there, there are various kinds of histories and, 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 and some of my favorites are what I refer to as monographic histories. That is, these are, these are histories on a very narrow subject and they tend to honestly be excruciatingly boring. They're typically written by a historian who wants to get tenure or something and therefore is trying to, trying to put this before his, his, his tenure board. But what I find with these things is that, well, first of all, they're, they're, they're full of tremendous detail um, in and of themselves, things that can be mined for, a, for, a, 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 for something that I'm working on. But I find that the best material in these things is in the footnotes because the writer, the historian, you know, probably has a terrific sense of story, but can't use it in this material, but lays it all out in the footnotes. That's, that's where I always feel you can find the juice. The best example I have of that, by the way, um, I, I mean, this came up time and again with, with Splendid and the Vile, but the, the, the most vivid moment for me of, of, of a footnote spurring something was, was when I was looking for a book at the time that I hit on the idea for, for Devil in the White City. And I was thinking about doing a book, hoping to do a book about a real life murder in the past, something that would, would evoke a sense of, of, of a time period in the way that one of my favorite um, uh, thrillers did, which was a book called The Alienist by, mm -hmm. um, by Caleb Carr. Um, so I started looking for uh, a, a nonfiction murder. Um, I eventually, gave up on that. But then I started for some reason focusing on the World's Fair of 1893 because I had seen it in the glancing reference. So I started reading this monograph about one of the pavilions at the fair, this incredibly boring book. But then I turned to the footnotes and that's where the inspiration for that book came from. And, and, and I can tell you which footnote it was. It was where this writer um, noted the fact that at the World's Fair of 1893, Juicy Fruit Gum was introduced to the American public. And that to me lit my imagination. I mean, I was a big chewer of, of Juicy Fruit Gum. And the idea that this gum could be a hundred years old, I just said, wow, what was this fair all about? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized I love this thing. And that's what made me do that particular book. It wasn't the serial killer. I came to him sort of secondarily. Um, but that was a footnote that bred that, that, that book. So footnotes to me are, I, I love footnotes. I read footnotes in, in any book that I read. It takes me a while to read those books, but I love footnotes. Yeah, footnotes are, um, I, I, I was even thinking of in novels, novelists who use footnotes, sometimes the footnotes are the best part, like David Foster Wallace. Yeah, with yeah, yeah absolutely. And, um, so one thing that I noticed reading your book is that the chapters are very short. Um, like Tolstoy with Anna Karenina. He, he has super short chapters and the effect is that the book zips along very quickly, even though it's filled with dense material. Um, and the other thing about your chapters is that they vary so much in style and content. You have these have sort of heavy military history moments and then you'll pull back. And one of my favorite of those was a chapter called Tea, which is ostensibly about the British and why they love tea and that there are shortages of tea. But it's really about how, I think you said this, that tea becomes a balm um, for the trauma of war and it became a sort of visual metaphor for the British of, of carrying on. And I wondered how you came to those. I love those sort of interludes that you have throughout the book. Well, in this, in, in that case, I mean, what what actually did strike me throughout the throughout the research was the the repeated references in diaries and so forth to tea, some positive references, some negative references, um, and so to me, tea became um, just as by the way, the full moon becomes something like this. Tea became a motif for me through through the book, and I made it a point where somebody did introduce a reference to tea, even in the context of something that had nothing to do with tea, I would, I would, I would include that in, in, in the narrative because I like the idea of this, this almost being like a thread through, through, through the book, this idea of tea, 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 because it was so important to the, to the, to the public. Um, but you mentioned short, par short, uh, short uh, chapters. My feeling is that, that, that writing, um, uh, the, 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 the way a book is presented to a reader is a very physical process. It's, a, it's like there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a pleasantness to the way a book is perceived by, by a reader or an unpleasantness. And my feeling is that 
the best thing is to have have variety. Long chapters. Now, for me, a long chapter is like six to ten pages. They're not super long by anybody's standards, but they're long for me. But then I intersperse those with, as you point out, very short chapters. Um, sometimes even just a couple of references from a diary that constitutes an entire chapter. Because yes, um, I love the way it accelerates the pace. That's very important. But also I like the visual, you know, almost the almost the tact, not, not tactile, but the visual feel, the, what, what, what that imparts to the experience of reading the book, this idea of short, long, short, long. And you know, I don't know how you read a book, but when I read a book at night, you know, when I, when I come to the end of a chapter, I'm, I'm more inclined than not. <laughs> And not frankly to, to fold a page over. Yes, I do that. Fold a page over. <laughs> fold a page over. Shut the book and and fall asleep. You know. But my strategy is because I know that there are readers out there who are like me. My strategy is to then at the end of a pair after a fairly longish chapter, throw in a, a short chapter. I refer to these as chapterlets. Chapterlets, um, which will be the entire chapter is visible on a single page. Because then, you know, you, you're going to read that chapter, I feel. Um, you're not going to not read it. And so there's that, so there's that, that little, every, every, every extra page, I think, that, that I, can, I can convince a reader to read in a, in a single sitting, I think, is a victory one. And so short chapters are my thing. And then as the book nears its end, the chapters get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah, they do. And there's this propulsive um, way that the, and, and a layering um, is sort of like eating a part of a brownie. You know, you eat a brownie and then you're like, oh, I could just have a So you have these short chapters that serve that function. So I know people are dying to ask questions. I'm going to ask you one more, I guess. Um, I think that we have time for that and then I'll, I'll open it up. Um, okay, so here's a question I had about character. You deal with this incredibly large cast of characters with such skill. And I noticed that you do this by using one person as an entry point in scenes, um, creating a distinct individual who then guides the reader through the scene or the section. Uh, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about creating characters in nonfiction. You've mentioned in interviews that your favorite character in the book is Mary, uh, who is um, the youngest daughter yeah. of Churchill. Um, and I also wanted to ask you in the same question about you talk about how you used Vonnegut's idea of the story arc, the man in a hole was your kind of model for this uh, uh, structure. And um, I wondered how character fits into that as well. Oh, first, let's talk, yeah, let, first let me talk about character and then remind me, remind me about to talk about right. Vonnegut, yeah. how, how and why I used Vonnegut. But yeah, one of the important things is, you know, you, you have an event, um, and what you need is to find characters to hold hands with through, through that event. And selecting those characters, I think, is very, very important. You can't write about everybody, and you can't write about everybody in the same detail. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but I try to find characters who are intrinsically interesting in and of themselves and who play, obviously, an important role in the story. So there are those who may take issue with my selection of, <coughs> excuse me, my selection of characters in the, in this book, but but they all play a very important role in shaping how Churchill Churchill dealt with the, the crisis of of 1940-41, and 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 finding those characters takes a, you know a, a significant significant amount of effort. Um, uh, you, you you sort of put them on your palettes. And then as I'm going into the archives, I'm finding little bits and pieces of, about the various characters. And eventually characters step forward as, yeah, this is an interesting guy. This is, or, or, or they sort of almost literally raise their hands and say, I wanna be in your book. And so here's what I'm gonna tell you about myself. And this is why you need to include me. So, so where does all this fit in with, with, with uh, Vonnegut? First of all, we're talking about the Vonnegut curve. Okay. Kurt Vonnegut came up with this, this thing um, for a, uh, I think it was for his master's thesis at the uh, University of Chicago. And, um, um, and he loved it. The, the, his uh, thesis advisors uh, rejected it, uh, he felt, because, uh, because it was too much fun and, and, and too, too clear and too simple. But what this was, was a schematic way of analyzing any story. You have a, um, a, a vertical axis at, at, at one end of the page, which is um, fortune to misfortune. Then you have a chronological axis, you know, of course, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And then you plot the events in your book 
along along the, these these various axes. And it's very very powerful for trying to determine exactly what your narrative arc is. And of course, by that we mean, you know, whatever it is that powers that book, whatever it is that ascends through that book. And and so, you know, certain characters, of course, are going to be key nodes on that on that ascending arc and you want characters who will who will if you yeah you know, if you like who, who will help you power that arc along churchill of course being the the central character and the reason i refer to this as in, i think in my author's note as a as man in the hole that was one of the one of the one of the schema that kurt vonnegut came came up with and that is guy starts out tremendously success Tremendous success, which is what Churchill did on May 10, 1940. I mean, he, he became prime minister. That's the thing he had lived his life to become. Mm. And then, the, you know, all hell breaks loose. You know, literally that day, uh, Germany invades the Low Countries um, uh, and things get darker and darker and darker. Now, this did not throw him, of course, because Churchill was, Churchill, Churchill actually loved war and loved the thrill of trying to deal with this, this awful situation. But that's man in the hole. Begins at the top, triumph. Boom, suddenly in the depths. And how does he dig himself out of that hole? Yeah, it's a wonderful um, schema. I love that you used it. All right, I'm going to take some questions here from the right. side. So shall we, shall we plunge in? Yeah, I'm going um, to have water. It's not gin. Water. I'll have water too. I'll go water. Okay. I guess I could have done it after I asked you the question. OK. Um, what? This is from Rita Ann. Uh, what was the most fascinating piece of history you learned when writing The Splendid in the Vile that you did not know before? You know, I, you know what? There's a, there's a bunch. I'll tell you what, what. One of the things that just just leapt into my mind. I mean, I, the first thing I was going to talk about was the fact that the that the British Navy um, had uh, attacked the French fleet in the in the Mediterranean. I think that was a very powerful powerful moment, certainly for Churchill. But one of the things that really surprised me and was just fascinating me and became incredibly valuable was this entity called mass observation. Mass observation um, was this uh, social science research organization founded before the war, before anybody imagined that there was a war coming. The idea being to try to understand routine British life. And the plan was to, to recruit hundreds of diarists to keep a daily diary of their lives. Which, which they did. Um, you know, one test for these, for these people who were recruited to, to become diarists for mass observation was that they were to, to take a look at their mantelpiece in their home and, and try to describe what was on the mantelpiece. So we're, we're basically talking about real quotidian kind of stuff. But then the war begins and many of these diarists continued to keep their diaries. And these became invaluable windows on how life was actually led. One of my favorite secondary characters in the book is Olivia Cockett, a young woman who is um, a Scotland Yard clerk. She is having an affair with a, with a married man and is not shy about writing, but I might add. Mm -hmm. But you know, she she her her arc, her own arc in the course of writing this this keeping this wonderful diary. She's a very articulate woman. Um, I think tracks the arc of the British public as they came to learn the art of being fearless. Because, because you know, when the first deliberate bombing occurred of London occurred on September 7th, uh, 1940, and I say deliberate because on August 24th, there had been an accidental bombing. Of course, the British didn't know that, but the Germans did. But on September 7th, 1940, this was the first deliberate raid. It was terrifying. She was terrified. So many people, were, everybody was terrified. Uh, but then one night, um, uh, uh, she, the, the, when a, a Germans launched these air raids at night, they would drop incendiary bombs first, the idea being that, that they would set fire to structures. These fires would then guide the bombers to follow, which were carrying high explosive bombs, including bombs up to 4,000 pounds in, in, in weight. So one of these incendiary bombs landed outside her house. And she, as people were asked to do, she actually put it out. She snuffed it out and she was so thrilled, so emboldened by this fact that she was no longer a passive victim that it really changed the course of her life through, through the rest of the year. She became just a very, very brave young woman. Now, unfortunately for her, 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 her lover um, became more and more of a coward and this really, this really annoyed her. So the, the, one of my favorite little moments with her was, was where they were walking through, uh, walking home through 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 an air raid as one does, and and heard two uh, two bombs falling. They made a distinctive sound, and Bill, her lover, um, shouts for her, shouts, you know, get down, get down, 
And she, her response is, not in my new code, I'm not. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, I'm not even gonna comment because I know people wanna get their questions asked, so I'll move to the next. Um, all right, this is a question from Tyler who comments that Anne Frank wrote, I still believe in spite of everything that people are truly good at heart. When I read books on World War II, when I read books, I always look for clues of this in Germans. And in your book, uh, Goebbels writes, wrote, human beings are so stupid, life is so short, and they then go and make it so hard for themselves. To me, this seems like a human thing to say, but it came from a terrible person. Yeah. Did you find other instances of good intentions or warm hearts from those higher ranking Germans? You know, um, well, <laughs> not from Hitler, but, but you know, uh, one thing I, I, I really believe in when I'm trying to write, uh, when I'm writing history is I believe in, in the power of nuance. No one, is, no, no one is universally evil except Hitler and no one is universally good. Um, and, and, so, and I think it's very important to sort of get that perspective. And one thing that comes through in Joseph Goebbels' um, diary, one thing that I was, really, I was really struck by, we know him today to be this absolute monster. He was, he was probably foremost among Hitler's senior guys in, in, at the forefront of hating Jews and trying to make their lives miserable. But when you read his diary, um, it's really kind of, kind of fascinating. He, he's, he's, he, he, he's kind of like any, anybody else. He's weary, he's tired at the end of the day. There are moments where he clearly wishes all this were over. He loves his kids. He loves going to his country house. It does happen to have 70 rooms, but let's just leave that aside. He loves going to his country house. Um, he loves, he has his own love for, for, for all the paraphernalia of, of Christmas and so forth. And I feel it's very important to convey that because, you know, in between all these little moments where he's professing his affection for his children, he's doing monstrous things. And that, to me, that heightens the monstrosity. Mm -hmm, for sure. Here's a question from Bill. He says it's kind of a geeky writerly question. Yeah. You make extensive use of archives and other sources in your research, and then you thoroughly document your sources in your end notes. How do you keep track of the attribution of these sources during the writing process? <laughs> so yeah, well, you know, I have learned my lesson, by the way, because when I, my, my first work of so-called narrative history, Isaac Storm, a giant storm that destroyed Galveston, Texas in the year 1900, I just wrote the book um, feeling um, confident in myself that when it came time to do my footnotes, um, I would be able to find material readily that I was quoting in the book and so forth. That turned out not to be the case. It was a brutal journey trying to put those footnotes together. So I learned my lesson and, and in the case of Splendid and the Vile, you know, it's a little awkward, but whenever I would have a quote or a fact or whatever I felt that I would eventually need to footnote, I would put in brackets at the end of that sentence the coding that I have for that identifies where that thing is going to be found. When I say coding, it's going to be you know, essentially like, like you know, uh, probably uh, um, a, a one word plus three or four numbers. You know, it's a very small thing to put in that bracket. But I learned this lesson. I mean, um, because now whenever I finish doing the manuscript, it's time when my editor says that dreaded that dreaded phrase. Okay, now when are I, when am I getting the notes? It's so much easier because I know my coding is very good. I know where my documents are. I know where these facts are. I can find them in a heartbeat. And, and that makes it very, very, very easy. And then what I do, I, I, I make a, I, I, I copy that, um, I copy that whole draft into my computer and I make that my final draft. I strip out. Do you write longhand? Sorry? Do you write longhand? No, 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 no. no but computer. you're saying copy it. Well, what, when I say copy, I mean, I'll take my, I'll take my draft that's on the computer already that has the brackets, the brackets for the footnotes. I'll make a second copy of that, you know, and I'll just copy it into my, you know, a new file. Um, and that's, that becomes the actual final draft from which I strip all the brackets. So I still have the source draft, so I know where everything is. Then I have the clean draft where there isn't that that constant interruption, because you know you can't read through something and see all these brackets and so forth, and and feel like you're getting a real sense of how something reads. Yeah. But basically, that's how, how I do it. I have a very complex coding system, and and that's how I how I do it. Did the fact checker you hired for this book uh, find anything that you were shocked you'd made a mistake with? Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to keep those to myself. Okay. She was Just wondering. She was. 
great, by the way. She's fantastic. That's and, you know, it, it's it's so lovely now also because, you know, so much stuff, so many books that I cited um, are actually available to, to her through her, her Google Books account. And so she would be coming back to me and saying, you know, you know, there's a, there's a comma in this quote that you don't have. And I'd be like, really? <laughs> and she, you know, she'd be right. This is what she does. She was great. Awesome. It was terrific. It must have felt like a safety net with a book like oh, this. Huge, huge safety net. But not just her, but also the fact that I sent it out to these three, these three senior guys, who these three Churchill experts. And each one, each one weighed in with some, you know, probably about three dozen little quibbles, happily no howlers, as I like to call them. But, but it was, at, and actually most of the things that they, they cited were not overlapping with each other, which was a little disconcerting. But it was very, very useful. It's, there's nothing... I, I'm going to do this for every book that I do from here on in, because there is nothing like going into publication day with confidence. Yes, right. Exactly. And do you write your footnotes yourself or uh, and notes, but, or did, did your fact checker help you with those? Oh, no, I, I do them myself. I do them myself. Yeah. In this case, the book was so large, you know, it's 500 pages and believe me, the, the draft that I sent to my long suffering editor was, was more like 800 pages, but the book was so long um, in, in terms of, uh, honestly, to, to conserve, conserve paper and cost. Um, I, I was not able to spend as much time telling stories in my footnotes as I, as I usually like to do. I mean, there, there are quite a few, but there are stories that I left out that would have gone on for another, like, like two pages in the notes. And I'd be fine with that, but my editor was not going to be fine with that. That actually brings up another question I have. I'll ask quickly because I know people want their questions, but um, there's so much material here, obviously. Would you ever return to Churchill? No, <laughs> I, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I mean, this was this was a journey. This was it was it was a difficult. This is probably the hardest book that I've I've, I've ever written, um, mainly because wrestling things together at the end, you know, trying to get this thing from from 800 pages to, to even to 500, which was much longer than I thought I would I would end up doing. I mean, I just really dwelled in the land of Churchill possibly far too long. And also, I don't, I don't like to continue. I don't like to do, I don't like to do books in the same realm that I did a book before. For example, I did, I did Isaac Storm, done one disaster. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I did that. So, so I'm probably not going to, again, never say never. I'm probably not going to do a, a Churchill book. I may do a Civil War book, but <laughs> I don't know at the moment. Um, I feel that way myself. I mean, I write novels, but recently- But you're, you're very historically, you know. Well, it's been set in the past recently, but even those are so different from each other and take place in different places and times. Anyway, not about me. Yeah, okay. that, that makes it, but that makes it, that's what makes it, I, I, honestly, I, I think that's what keeps keeps you from falling into a rut. I think it'd be very yeah. easy to fall into to sort of a, sort of a, a stereotype path where all you do is, write the same book over and over about the same same guy only in different time periods and and to me to me there is something very freshening and enlivening about jumping into something brand new with all the with all the hopes and fears and anxieties about that new subject you know you, you don't when you're when you're going to something new you don't take anything for granted you're not you're not smug you're not making assumptions you're going in you're going in brand new um, you know it's like so I don't want to make too much of this, but it's, it's like being born. You see everything new and in a fresh light. And I think that's invaluable. Yeah, it's a huge learning curve and it, there's nothing like it. You, you're, it's, um, and it's scary. Very scary. Very scary. Should be scary. Should be scary. That's, that's, the, that's good advice. It should be Maybe scary. not as scary as doing Churchill, but it should be scary. <laughs> All right. Here's a good one uh, from Jason. Beaverbrook happens to be one of the most single, single most fascinating characters I had barely heard of until your writing. Uh, where and how did you know, locate such in-depth information on him and who kept the most detailed journal on him was it Churchill? So you may need to explain who Beaverbrook is. Yeah, so this is, a, <laughs> thank you, I, I love Lord Beaverbrook. This is Lord Beaverbrook, Max Aitken is his, his name, you know, styled uh, in the custom of, 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 of British, uh, you know, honoraria, uh, styled Lord Beaverbrook. Um, Lord Beaverbrook was a British 
Press Barron. He's a longtime friend of Churchill's, um, whom Churchill appointed to be his Minister of Aircraft Production, like, like literally the day after uh, he was uh, Churchill became Prime Minister, because he knew he needed to ramp up production of, of aircraft, of fighter fighter planes. So Beaverbrook, um, there, there, there is a ton of material on Beaverbrook. First of all, there is an archive on on him, which resides. <laughs> resides in Westminster Palace. I had the great joy of being able to go into, into Westminster and be led by an escort, because you can't just wander in by yourself, be led by an escort down the Queen's elevator in, into the archive at, the, at Westminster Palace to go through Beaverbrook's papers, which was which is a wonderful thing. But really very, also very useful um, was where a couple of uh, memoirs by um, one of his secretaries, David Ferrer, who had some real, real compelling insights into uh, into Beaverbrook. But then there's also the official uh, official files of correspondence with Beaverbrook between Churchill and Beaverbrook and the, the Churchill archives and, and, and elsewhere. I mean, there was no paucity of material on Lord Beaverbrook. I loved him. And apparently a lot of women loved him too, although most men found him despicable. Clementine did not like him either, Clementine Churchill. Yeah, I mean, some of the most fun aspects of your of this book were all the sort of Inter, inter nessian battles between these people and the the who was in power and who wasn't and how they were jockeying for power and yeah. what their peers. One of my thought. favorite things about Beaverbrook was, was that you know I, he he did exactly what Churchill knew he would do. He caused a lot of problems, and that was that was why Churchill put him put him in this office in this brand new office was to shake up the aircraft industry. And, and Beaverbrook, when he felt he wasn't getting Churchill's attention, behaved like an absolute toddler. He would resign. In the course of that first year, 1940 to, to, to May 10, 1941, he resigned 14 times, 14 times to get just to get Churchill's attention. And finally, Churchill, of course, took him up on it. But anyway, I, I love that. I love those battles between between characters. That was so great. And also, I was thinking that like the moon and like tea, his resignations kept coming back. And you, you know, that was something that I didn't get to ask you about. But the book is funny. I mean, <laughs> there are actually these comical moments that are you write about sex quite a bit and about relationships and these moments when Churchill is storming around and nobody knows what to do. But you have this sort of comic edge to them. And how did you did you did, were you consciously doing that? You know, I, I, I know. Um, well, consciously, I mean, I was consciously writing the book, so I suppose so. But, but you know, like I say, nuance. Nuance is everything. You, yeah. you, 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 fighting the war was not the, the only thing that Churchill did in the, cor in the course of that year. And the things that, the things that I love, and this is why I don't use a, 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 any researchers, frankly, is because, because, you know, this may sound strange, but when I go into an archive, I don't really know what I'm looking for, but I will, I know when I'm going to find it. And, and one of the things I love to find are the, are the quirky elements of people, the things that, the things that might make somebody laugh, that might also, might also shed fresh light on a character or, or a time. I mean, I love the fact that, that Churchill, and the thing actually that surprised me, I like the fact that Churchill was a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun. He was a character. And, you know, he would he one one of my favorite scenes in the book. He's at the prime ministerial country estate checkers, which is a big part of the book. Also, mm -hmm. um, he was uh, there. He had a house full of guests. Um, and, and after dinner, after this dinner of champagne and brandy and everything else, and all the guests are in the great hall, you know, Churchill turns on the gramophone, there's some military music. And at this point, by the way, he's wearing his, 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 his siren suit. It's pale blue one piece jumpsuit of his own design. You can imagine Churchill's body in one of those. He's also wearing his, his gold and red silk dragon dressing gown. And he decides to get his manlicker rifle and attach a bayonet and do bayonet drills there in the Great Hall with all his guests gathered around on the, watching this thing happen. And very, very seriously, he did these bayonet drills to the music um, as everybody was you know, probably doubled over in laughter. I love those moments about church. Yeah, he's such a character. Um, okay, here's a fun one. So if you, this is from Michelle, if you could live through the events of one of your books, which one would you pick? And what role would you play? <laughs> oh, that's that adds a complicated element to it. Um, hmm. Well, I'll tell you, I I have to say, I would have I would love to have had a chance to to take a stroll through the grounds of the World's Fair of eighteen ninety three. 
And so maybe I would want to be, maybe I'd want to be Olmsted, the landscape architect, Frederick Law Olmsted. Although, although I wouldn't want to have all his various ailments. He had a lot of neurology, a lot of pain. I'd like to be able to be him, but without all of that. And be able to just sort of walk through this, 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 this wonderful cityscape created in record time. And, and, and although I, I, the problem with being Olmsted, um, I, I think I would be fretting a lot about how things were going because he was such a perfectionist and he believed that, that to do a proper landscape took years and you couldn't just do it in a year and a half and yet he, he, he did. That's good. I like it. All right. Here's a very specific question from yes. Bob. Is it true that Hitler never bombed Oxford because he wanted to make it the center of learning for the Third Reich? <laughs> I don't know that. It may be true. I don't know that. Did not come across that. <laughs> I, but I do know what I do know and was, was a key element in the book is that Hitler, Hitler um, explicitly forbade the bombing of central London. Um, early on because he did not want to so alienate the British public and also so alienate Churchill that he would not go to the peace table because Hitler, Hitler prior to September 7th, 1940, really hoped that Churchill um, would come to his senses and negotiating a deal with Germany and get out of the war because obviously, as we all know, Hitler had, had certain designs on the Soviet, Soviet Union. But I don't know that about, I don't know that about about Oxford. I know yeah. that the bombs dropped on Oxford, but I don't know that there was any specific plan. Interesting. This is one that I actually thought I wondered about too. So Richard asks, um, Snake Hips, chapter, uh, page 387. So can you explain the, the mentality of the British youth to go bar hopping and party all night long right after the Cafe de Paris was bombed. This is one example of many joyful events during horrible times. Yeah, I, I, I found that that whole whole element of the story um, uh, very, very, very compelling. I'm glad this, this, this reader asked about it. Snake Hips was a, one of my favorite secondary or tertiary characters. He's a band leader who was, I won't say what happens to him, but. But this, this is, it was all centered around the fact that Mary Churchill um, and her family and friends went to, um, on a particular Saturday night in, in March, 1941, went to Queen Charlotte's Ball, which is the start of the social season to, to attend the coming out uh, of the debutantes for, the, for, that, for that year. Mary had already come out the year before, but they were there, she with her mother and her friends and so forth. And as they're there, in, at, this, at this Queen Charlotte's Ball, which is underground, um, there is a very severe air raid begins and, and the, the party goes on. They, they can hear the guns, they can hear the bombs and so forth. Simultaneously at the Cafe de Paris, which is a very popular nightclub, things were ramping up for, for a hot Saturday night. Snake Hips was on his way over to take up the, take up the bandstand. Um, uh, and, and Cafe de Paris was where Mary and her friends were, had, had planned to eventually end up that night. I don't really want to give away what happens, but you know, obviously, it was a very, it was a very suspenseful and dramatic and ultimately macabre, macabre situation. But yes, they 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 danced that night anyway because, and they felt that those who were, those who were killed that night would have wanted them to do that because that's what you did at this time. You know, you had to live your life. Mm, okay, great. I think we're gonna we have time for one more. Some okay. people are talking about. Um, Amor's book, Gentleman in Moscow. Amor's one of our drinking buddies. Yes. We like hanging out with him. Um, so someone asks, do you have a favorite writer that you like to read? But, or is there a book you're reading now that would be, um, that you'd like to recommend? Well, Christina Baker Klein. I mean, oh, what else? Right. Yeah, I, 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 read, I read widely and eclectically. I, I, I can't tell you, I can't tell you a favorite writer. I, I can tell you something I just finished reading that I loved. It's a book called Things in Jars by, uh, by Jess Kidd, an Irish writer. And it's, I think it's fabulous and magical and perfect pandemic reading. I mean, you just get lost in the, lost in the language. I, I haven't encountered anybody who writes like her um, uh, yet in terms of the pure prose quality. So, so right now, uh, she's one of my favorites. Uh, but tonight- Who, who, who pick, is it? Uh, 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 Jess Kidd, K-I-D-D. Mm -hmm. But tonight I'm gonna. You know, I, start, I finished that a couple of days ago, and but tonight I'm 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 rereading uh, Lord of the Flies. Tonight, 
Well, I started that yesterday night, and I'm, I'm going to continue that. I mean, it's it's surprisingly escapist. I mean, it is after all an island. You're not tempted by Tiger King, or uh, you know, no, no I'm not <laughs> too tempted. hot to handle, no. or no, whatever. Okay, no. um, Eric, thank you so much. This thank has been you. incredibly illuminating, and I think everybody's had a great time. I certainly have. So well, thank you. this is this is great fun. Next time, wine in a restaurant. I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, so just one more time, I want to say thank you, Eric. Thank you, Christina. This has been such a great conversation. And uh, Eric, congratulations on the new book. Christina, congratulations on your book coming this September. I want to say thank you to the International Churchill Society for co-producing this event with us. And thank you, everyone, for watching. You've been a great audience and submitted some really great questions. Just as a reminder, you can find The Splendid and the Vile and all of Eric's books at penguinrandomhouse.com. And you can pre-order Christina's upcoming title, The Exiles, at her website, christinabakerkline.com or wherever books are sold. So thanks, everyone. Um, have a great night. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>